Welcome, everybody. Um, hope you had a good lunch. This is data and back again. Lessons learned from shipping web data connectors. At Tableau, connectivity is at the core of what we do. If we can't connect to your data, it makes it very challenging for you to use our products. A subset of those data sources that we want to connect to are cloud data sources. And internally, in our connectivity platform, we've chosen to use the web data connector framework to build these connectors ourselves and connect to these cloud applications. Today, we want to share with you some of the insights and, learn and lessons that we learned while shipping these connectors over the past few years. But first, let's get to know each other a little better. My name is Mario, and I'm originally from Argentina. I live in the Northwest for the, it's been 18 years. I'm a soccer fan, proud, proud fan of the Seattle Sounders, current MLS champions. And uh, yes, last night I almost had a heart attack. Well, Argentina almost didn't qualify for the World Cup. But that's a sensitive subject, uh, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, I joined Tableau two years ago. Um, in Tableau, I've worked on online services, connectivity platform, which includes the web data connector platform. And lately, I've been working on our data prep product called Project Maestro. With me today is Javier Valderrama. We call him Jax. He's gracefully allowed me to come and present with him. Uh, he's done most of the work. Um, why don't I let him introduce himself? OK. Uh, as Mario said, uh, my name is Javier. Uh, you can call me Jax. I'm a software engineer at Tableau, and I've been working on web-related technologies since 2001, which is a long time. We used to care about banners waiting less than 35 days at that time, which is ridiculous. So in my time at Tableau, I'm dedicated uh, on the web data connectors uh, life cycle and design. And as Mario said, I'm Argentinian too, so if I say liar instead of layer, just clap your hands, and I'll give you a gift, OK? So Mario, can you explain more about what, where are we inside Tableau? Uh, yes. So this is a slide that uh, you've seen a lot on the, on the dev track. The Tableau development platform allows you to do a ton of stuff, from automating tasks, uh, adding integration to data science technologies, embedding VCs everywhere, and our brand new extensions APIs. I want to acknowledge Sam Desmond back in, the, back in the room. He's one of the main devs for the extensions API, which we're very excited to see at the keynote today. Uh, there are other sessions, including Sam's, that will speak about these other areas. Today, we're going to focus on data connectivity. So let's talk more about that. As I said, we've chosen internally Web Data Connectors platform as an avenue to connect to cloud data sources. So what is a web data connector? We look at it as a shim, as a middleware between Tableau and the data. In Tableau, you care about ingesting the data to build insights. And so we build the mechanism for you to delegate to another component all the tasks of authenticating to the cloud application, piping the data into Tableau, and building a data model for you to work through. A fun fact is that a lot of the connectors that you've learned to use and love within Tableau are built with this technology. To name a few, QuickBooks Online, Marketo, Anaplan, Eloqua, and lately ServiceNow are all connectors that we've built with uh, WDC. When I say we, it's a lot of people. Mainly Jax and the team did it. Um, why don't we get started and go through some of the topics um, that we'll go through in this talk. First of all, acknowledgement to Jax again for the Harry Potter theme. If you have any questions about that, talk to him after the session. <laughs> um, what we're going to try and tell you today, it's a little bit what we call take you backstage and show you what we've learned. How did we build these connectors? And what are some of the insights that we've learned? So we're going to start telling you a lot of the resources that we use internally as we embark on building a new web data connector. We call these your champions, you know, the things that are going to help you tackle uh, the unknown, the obstacles ahead. Speaking of that, we're going to talk to you about what Jax calls Cerberus. 
It's allegedly, it's a three-headed monster. Uh, and the reference is to some of the challenges that we'll find while you try to connect to this data. We'll talk to you about the different ways of authentication and how that may impact your development experience. We'll talk to you about um, bringing data and doing filtering on that data and how that will improve performance and interactivity of your connector. And we'll also talk about the data prep stage. Essentially, how can you help the analyst by building a data model that's gonna help them build insights effectively? After that, we'll tell you a little bit about some of the development cycle that we take on and what are the tools that we use when we do that. We've built a process throughout the years for building web data connectors and we wanna share with you some of, the, some of those insights. And finally, what's next? Once you're armed with all this information, um, we wanna share with you some of the challenges that you may face in the future. We call this the unknown. We don't know what kind of cloud applications you're gonna to try to connect to or what kind of remote data you'll try to connect to. So we have some guidance or tips, if you will, uh, to help you tack tackle those challenges. Let's get to choosing our champions. So this is all about what are the resources that we have internally um, and that we share with the community to learn about data connectors. Some of these points you will have seen in other slides. And really, it's because it's, it's what we used to ramp up. Essentially, all the sessions that we do this year, last year, and the year before them are great resources for you to ramp up um, on how to use the technology. In fact, when a new dev joins my team, this is exactly where I point him to. Additionally, I also point him to our developer portal. We've done a lot of work to try to consolidate and curate these resources so that you have a smooth experience ramping up. And last but not least, we've done a lot of work on the Web Data Connectors documentation itself. Uh, the docs are a live document that we update constantly. In fact, it's been updated earlier this week. Uh, we have a pretty thorough API reference that you can refer to to learn more about the capabilities of the SDK. And finally, a lot of you had built yourself connectors that we can leverage each other to bootstrap our development or to learn how you tackle different um, other challenges. But why don't I let Jax tell you in more detail how do we use these resources and what are the ones that we've identified as key for our success? Perfect, so uh, first of all, one of the keys of this breakout session is try to uh, avoid redundancy on the information we give to you. So many of these links were already explained in different breakouts, like on uh, Sam's breakout or in Drew's breakout. Uh, there were many. So we are only referring and giving you the link so you can explore more. Uh, for example, the Web Data Connectors resources here available is part of our daily process. We use this same information we are sharing with you all day. We need something from this information, we go this, grab it, understand it, study it. Uh, one of these tools is, for example, the Web Data Generator, which is a, a scaffolding tool to create the basic structure for a connector, so you can uh, start working and uh, directly putting your code on a basic structure without starting from zero. Uh, another thing that uh, you can use and we use every day is the simulator. The simulator allows you to make a more granular uh, investigation on the data flow and how the data is moving across the connector, the API, and the Tableau scheme. So it's very important for you to understand how does it work and which are uh, the, the, the tools that it provides to you. It practically uh, emulates everything that is in Tableau in a web browser, in an external web browser that you can use. Uh, lately, uh, there was um, a leash to the wild, this uh, Tableau Log Viewer. Uh, the Tableau Log Viewer allows you to inspect the logs Tableau Desktop generates. It generates a lot of logs with information, very precious information about how the data was going on 
inside Tableau, how was it treated, uh, which were uh, the faces, and which points uh, it was touching inside Tableau. But the amount of information inside there might be huge. So a system or a tool for finding the logs you want to inspect is very important. And last but not least, uh, you have the issue tracker on GitHub and Stack Overflow tag. So you can uh, leverage the information other people were asking for. Uh, maybe they have the same questions you had, and maybe there is already an answer there, so you don't have to find the answer for yourself. It's very important for you to uh, leverage the community and not only us. Uh, additionally, there is also uh, the resource uh, for the developer track content that is gonna be available for you. So every single uh, breakout session will expose their information and you can have links or uh, explore in the other um, aspects of the web data connectors. Or you can uh, watch a videos available on YouTube, current videos for uh, these sessions or uh, the previous session like on TC16. So we're ready to tame the beast? Yeah, so uh, we can start with the beast. The beast uh, is like the guardian for your data, and it's going to determine if you're worthy of grabbing the data and use it. So you have to be very gentle with this and to go across all the three heads that are the main aspects we found uh, as a challenge on a connector. The first phase is authentication and authorization. So they are both uh, very um, different um, very different aspects of a flow, and they are correlated, but they are not the same. Authentication implies the analysis of your credentials. So it's only expect if, you are, uh, if your credentials are known. It doesn't validate the user, but the credentials only. And then there is the authorization, and the authorization is always happening after authentication. Uh, for a given uh, authenticated subject, the system will try to find if you have the rights and the permission to read the information and which kind of permission you have to read that information. In many uh, APIs, this is a very critical information you have to understand. For example, on ServiceNow, there might be a permission level at table level, so you might not be able to create a VIS without the right uh, permissions for your user. So it's super critical you uh, find that information on the API documentation. Uh, Tableau can handle three authentication types. I'm going to show you something here. Give me one second. Okay. We have uh, the authentication type none, which is no authentication. You can access a public API or a document. Then there is the basic authentication that will prompt you for username and password and it handles the more simple, simple uh, way of authentication, and there is the custom authentication type. What's a custom authentication type? Everything else. There you can uh, handle uh, different authentication systems, like, as I said, basic authentication, which is a more simple system. You provide, so in this relationship in two, you provide username and password, and the password is encoded, uh, but this encoding is very uh, light. You are passing a base 64 encoding uh, to make sure the charges are passing correctly. And you use a header name, authorization. Uh, it's not happily named, but that's the name of the header. You pass information, the system authenticates you, uh, and authenticates you. And uh, the bad thing here is that you have to pass the credentials in each connection. Each time you need to, to connect, you need to pass uh, the credentials along the way. So you need here to use a secure layer and to make sure, layer, I said layer, oh, you have a price. <laughs> the price is you have uh, my gratitude forever. <laughs> it's a curse. Thank you. He's my manager. <laughs> okay. Then uh, you want to make this better. And there is another authentication system that is HMAC. Uh, it's used uh, a, a cryptographic hashing function uh, where you can pass along uh, um, a secret. 
So technically, uh, the server in this relationship in two, and you share a secret, you use this secret uh, together with the message, and you sign the, the message you are sending. So the server can uh, replicate this uh, hashing system and uh, understand if the message was tampered along the way. So it's not super secure about the secretness of the information, but it guarantee, guarantees the, the message um, tampering or security. You are sending that message and you make sure that the same message arrives to the, to the server. Um, but the bad thing here is that you have to sign every single message again. So uh, this system is very used in uh, other systems. In the APIs, it's not uh, very uh, common, but it's worth it to mention it. So what can we do uh, here to make it better? In 2007, uh, there was the first draft of OAuth released uh, to the wild. And in 2010, I think, uh, Twitter uh, made that mandatory for connecting to the API of uh, Twitter. So every single third-party um, application needed to, be, to use OAuth 1 to connect to the API. It has uh, some goods and some bads. One of the goods is that it's uh, transport independent uh, because it uses, again, a hashing system. So you, can, you have to sign every single message. Uh, the counterpart is that uh, currently it's being deprecated. So many systems are moving from OAuth 1 to OAuth 2. Uh, I can describe briefly how it works if you want. So this relationship is a relationship in three. So we have no more two in this relationship. We have the user, that is you, the connector, that is the consumer, and uh, the service provider that might be, for example, QBO. So uh, QBO signs a contract with us and uh, with the connector and say, hey, connector, uh, we'll give you this secret so I know anytime you connect to me and you start a connection, that is you. And then you can send a user on your behalf. So the flow looks like this. There is a user that says, hey, connector, I would like to grab my information from QBO. And uh, the connector says, hey, QBO, I have this user, and he needs the information uh, for uh, his data that is on you. So QBO says, who are you? Oh, you know my secret. I'm giving you my secret. OK, I know you are the QBO connector, the QuickBooks online connector. Uh, and once it realized that it's a known connector, a known application, it sends a token to the connector saying, hey, you, I give you this token, so you can give this token to the user, and the user can talk in your behalf with me. So we have a common secret here. Okay, so the connector redirects the user to uh, QuickBooks Online, and uh, the user says, hey, QuickBooks, I would like to have my information. And QuickBooks says, okay, I know you're coming from the QBO connector, but I don't know you. Can you provide me your credentials? Sure. In this way, the user doesn't need to share their credentials with the application, which is good, because there is a single point of failure for their credentials. Uh, at that moment, uh, the user is authenticated, and the flow starts. And QBO says, OK, I know you. What do you want from me? I would like to have the information regarding my company. Perfect, but before I can go, uh, I can go on. You have to authorize me to provide this data to the connector. OK, I authorize you. So the user uh, asks uh, that information to QBO, and QBO gives him a particular uh, token that is used for the next calls. It's called the access token. And this token will live for a, a specific amount of time that might belong in OAuth 1. So in that way, the user doesn't need to use this token for every single request that is, uh, sorry, the authentication for every single request. It only pass uh, the token. And that's it. They are ready to go, and they can grab the information directly from QBO. Uh, OAuth 2 is very similar to that, but uh, the security relies on the secure layer. So now it's transport dependent, and there is no need of uh, signing every single message uh, you are using there. So it's a very big improvement. 
uh, taking into consideration that both OAuth 1 and OAuth 2 are kind of frameworks. So there are many implementations uh, you can use. There is one leg, two leg, three leg, uh, eco. There are many. And after that, there are many implementations the user might uh, implement on their side. And after that, there are a lot of different authentication systems. Unapplied use certificates. Uh, Marketo use a particular URL for a service you generate on their API. So understanding the way the API authenticates you, uh, authenticate you uh, is super important for this flow, and it might determine if you're able to refresh your data in some way or you cannot, or if you have to create a proxy to hold your secrets or you're free to go uh, directly on the HTTP connection. Uh, the second head here is filtering. Uh, why is filtering so important? Um, technically, we discover that more than 95% of the time on a web data connector is network traffic. So if you know exactly what you want from the third party API, you can use uh, different techniques to retrieve only the information you need and nothing else. It will reduce the time to make the extra uh, very uh, dramatically. Uh, it might be uh, reducing from hour, one hour to five minutes. And you want to have the information right away while you are creating your extract. Uh, there are many systems or many uh, tools uh, the Tableau API provides you. One is uh, joint filtering. Um, I will show you something here regarding that. Um, okay. Perfect. Uh, in the join filtering, uh, you can define a dependency from a table to another and skip one uh, step and retrieve only specific information you want to retrieve from there. Um, then there is uh, incremental refreshes. Uh, for example, you want to grab the information regarding the last month, but you don't want to grab the information from the first day all the time. And you can pass a specific um, data set on a specific configuration to the connector to say, hey, use this column as a key, as an incremental key, and ask the API for the information from the last uh, significant number on that key. So you don't have to grab the whole information, but only the information you don't have. That is super, super, super important. Another aspect that you need to, to care about is that uh, more than 99% of the APIs are not going to give you the whole information at once. They are going to give you chunks of information or pages of information, if uh, you want to call it like that. So taking in account how the API paginates, how it can uh, provide you specific uh, or reduced amount of data is super important here. And if you have uh, the ability to ask the data from a specific number to another specific number, for example, dates, that would be great. But there might be the case in where you have the ability to ask the information from a date, but not to a date. And you have to post filter on your connector the information there. And there are also cases like in Marquito uh, for the leads where you cannot filter the information directly. And you have to go to another table, retrieve all the information regarding the new lead, and then use the lead IDs to retrieve the information in chunks from the lead table. Uh, there are a lot of aspects on the design you need to take care about that, and particularly the user experience. So if you're going to retrieve a lot of data, uh, we know that it's going to be gigs of data, it's not Terra, because you are using a web data connector, which is extract only. But uh, anyway, it might take time to have that data. So it's important that you bring that data in chunks also to Tableau. You can request the, the data in chunks, and you can send that data in chunks to Tableau. In that way, you are free memory, and you also can communicate that process to the user, because the user doesn't want to be there for one hour and saying, it's broken, it's not working, I don't know what's happening. 
feels hanged. So, yeah, so you can send like, hey, I'm uh, retrieving 300 rows, and then the next 300, and you have some delightful information there. Um, there is also uh, an aspect here that is super important, that is uh, timeouts and retries. Uh, the APIs might uh, give you a specific limitation on the amount of data per time they can give you. And they might say, hey, after X uh, max of data, uh, you cannot make more requests in this minute, but you have to wait for the next minute. And it's so important that we have a specific module to handle retries and timeout. Uh, okay, we filter the data, we have the data, uh, the exact data we want to send to Tableau, but we don't know how we want to send that data to Tableau. And this is like uh, the, the top of the challenge. Uh, here's where you construct, you build your data model. There is no uh, good data model uh, standalone. It only depends on the context. It only depends on how you want to analyze that data. You might hit the same endpoint and build different data models for your vis. So if you're uh, able to discuss that with your data analyst, that would, would be the great difference between uh, making a good connector for the vis or having to lose a lot of time. And we had the problem. Uh, probably Mario can explain you something about that later. Uh, then you're prep, prepping a lot of data. Take care about memory. Be careful with the memory. Uh, the memory on the simulator is not the memory of on Tableau desktop, so you need to handle that very particularly and try not to do what I did several times, like crashing Tableau because I was using too much memory for an experiment. Uh, then uh, Tableau uh, doesn't have the ability to guess a missing column. There are APIs that might not give you a specific column when it has no data. So if you know the structure or the data model you want to send to Tableau, make sure you default the proper values there. And by defaulting the proper values, you also need to take care about the type of the data you're sending. Because if you process the type and you uh, make the type explicit before sending that to Tableau, you are going to save a lot of time. And uh, you are going to be able to make better joints and better uh, bits there. Then flattening, denormalizing data, that's uh, your data people, so you know what's that. Uh, the structure on the uh, on the databases might not be the one you need and you need to construct that and to create and to make a lot of decisions there. And for example, uh, if you have a hierarchical structure, you need to make it a tabular structure to send it and there are a lot of techniques to make that. Uh, performance, you are treating a lot of data. This is JavaScript, this is a embedded browser. There are a lot of uh, things going around there. So be careful about the performance because it's going to impact uh, the final user. And uh, there are other tools, for example, the standard connections, where you might suggest the user a specific joint structure. You can say, hey, this is a particular structure I want to use uh, for uh, this um, data view. Uh, there are other tools like uh, defining join only tables where you can say this data view will be available only and only if a specific table is already on the data pane. Okay, it doesn't work by its own. And then again, you are prepping, working for a, uh, with a lot of data, so memory, take care about memory all the time. Wow, that's what I call <laughs> that a brain was it. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Um, we understand this is a little bit dry, uh, but to give you some metrics internally uh, with the connectors that we've built, it takes us about 100 developer days. That's to say if Jax by himself was to build one of these connectors, it would take him 100 days. We obviously stuff it more than that. Um, but out of that time, more than 30% of our effort is focused 
on these three obstacles. So I can't emphasize how important it is for you to familiarize yourself with the different types of authentications. OAuth is a spec, which means people can implement it in whichever flavor they want. And you have to be flexible enough to understand how they do it, to familiarize yourself with their authentication implementation, and build your connector uh, respectively. Like Jack said, 95% of the time of the connector is spent on the pipeline. You don't have to bring all of the data, but rather the data that you need to build a data model. And so the filtering techniques that you choose to implement for your data gathering phase are key to have a performance experience or at least a perceived performance experience where you can let the user know that you're doing work and make your connector more delightful. And finally, like Jax was mentioning, is the data prep phase. This is perhaps one of the most important phases for you to bring the data into Tableau. At the end of the day, if you can't build insights with this, you know, all that work is not really useful. A quick anecdote with QBO. QBO was the first, call it world-class uh, WDC that we shipped. And we learned a lot from it. That's why we're referring to it a lot. Uh, on the first version, we thought we were done. We did load testing, functional correctness, perf testing, and we shipped the beta. Our customers told us that with the data views that we shared, they couldn't build a PNL report. Duh. And so we had to go back, learn from that, update the data views that we presented, help them with standard connections so that they could actually build the insights. All these we've learned to pay attention a lot. Drew Loic is in the room and he helps us drastically working with customers to understand what is the right data model that we need to bring into Tableau for people to build the insights. Let's keep going. Our last theme in this uh, Harry Potter theme presentation is making allies. This is where we're gonna tell you a little bit about our development cycle and what is sort of like the different phases that we've learned to implement to build the data connectors. Remember, 100 days is a lot of time to spend, so we need to make sure that we make that efficiently. The first thing that we look into when we start a brand new data connector it's a checklist. We build a checklist over time. We call this process an API evaluation. Uh, and by now, it takes us roughly four weeks to go from, you know, I tell the team, hey, let's look into this connector. And they come back with a prototype that's slightly working. It takes roughly four weeks. And we've gotten to that timeline because we have a comprehensive checklist that we essentially test against the API that we're connecting to to make sure that we know in advance some of the challenges that we're going to face. But why don't I let this guy tell you a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, this point is so important that we are uh, thinking about other systems to evaluate uh, the APIs. Because this evaluation uh, makes a real difference when you start working and when you start understanding how it works and which kind of connector you can build and you can, send, uh, you can provide to the user. Uh, as I said before, uh, APIs might have limits on the amount of data or the amount of rows uh, per minute, per day, whatever. We hit that limit on Marquito during uh, testing uh, procedures and we were blocked on that uh, for an entire day, waiting for the other day to be able to run the test. So we created a lot of um, uh, instances on Marquito to be able to test with the amount of data we wanted and to have a lot of people testing the connector at the same time without blocking them mutually. Uh, does the API apply standards? Uh, it's clear the standard of the output of that API. Does it provide you a RESTful um, interface where you can understand the HTTP codes for the responses? Or does it provide you a 200 OK with an error message? It's very important that you understand how the API is built and how it responds to you and provides you information. It might give you uh, only JSON. It might uh, output JSON and XML at the same time. It might fail in a specific way that is not the standard way. We hit that also in another API, which in a certain error, it was outputting XML instead of JSON. And we needed to build a particular module to handle the output time. And 
to use the output type and the way we want it. Uh, is it consistently uh, updated and frequently updated? Uh, do they maintain that API in a proper way or in a suitable way for you? Is it a long time uh, for waiting for updates or it's too, too fast? For example, uh, the API of AdWords uh, changed dramatically in nine months and you might find there is information you were using that is not available anymore or that you are not providing the best of the application for the user because you are not using the, the new definition of the API. Does it provide you a schema endpoint so you don't have to infer the data types by yourself? You have the specific schema on the side and you understand the data on the side directly. Uh, does it provide you internationalization uh, tools so you don't have uh, to translate by yourself but you have the translation of the data of the table names, for example, or of the columns. Great. Like I said, this is a living document. If you actually have recommendations, we'd love to hear them at the end of the talk uh, for our API checklist. The second part on our development cycle, if you will, is where we try to validate a bunch of the assumptions that we've made while we evaluated the API. At this point, we have a certain number of questions that we are going to ask of the remote data source. We have an idea of what's the volume of data that we're going to get into. And so how do we test that? Can we handle that amount of data? Is the API going to throttle us and, and shut us down? Uh, and so this is where we use things like their resources, right? Like, do they have a sandbox that we can play with? Do they have an API explorer that we can try out things and see what the responses are uh, that we get? Um, what else do we use? So some APIs provide you sample data on the sandbox. So you can start working on real data uh, directly from the API. Uh, in that case, I, I will go through all the points because they are all correlated here. Uh, you might have, for example, uh, sample data that match the real data world, or you might find sample data that is not accurately reflecting how the data is nowadays on the API. Or they might be uh, having a legacy uh, data from a user, and it breaks your data model unexpectedly. So it's very important you understand if they provide you the way to test everything and to understand the model before you start coding. And finally, um, we built about six web data connectors. Every time we add a new one, and we've had plans to add a lot more, we essentially are taking a dependency on someone else's API. So how can we become more proactive when things change instead of reacting and essentially having all of our users think that Tableau doesn't work connecting to a particular connector. Um, there's no real secret sauce here other than trying to develop a partnership with the APIs that you depend on. But there's some things that we've learned along the way. For example, how mature is the API that you are connecting to? If it's V1, then you, know, you can expect, even from ourselves, we changed drastically on our V2 version of the WDC framework. And so you can expect a lot of churn to come from that API. So you, get, you gotta get ready with other things, like if the API fails, like what are the error types that you get? What are the error messages that you get? And how can you react to those to offer a graceful degradation of the experience for the user? Um, they're gonna have breaking changes. So when they do, how do they communicate that? How do they communicate the particular status for a particular API? How do they communicate when they have outages? Sometimes, you know, they, they just, the response won't return anything. And so how do you know if that's your problem, if you're calling that incorrectly, or if their service is down? These are things that are critical for you to react timely to your uses, users. As things change, and as you build uh, a relationship with partners, what are some of the resources, kind of like what we told you in the first set of slides, that you can leverage from them? Do they have a news feed? Uh, do they have webinars or training material that you can leverage to ramp up on their API, for example? Our example uh, is Marquito uh, on our life cycle. Uh, they have a, an excellent webinar, uh, and we subscribe to that, and the answers we had from those webinars really made the difference 
on the way we construct uh, the Marquito uh, connector. And we were able to communicate also our uh, suggestions or doubts or something that it wasn't really clear on the API documentation. Right. And finally, it's really key to get a contact on your partner to deal with things like bugs that you find in the API, to get ahead on some of the design changes that may introduce or some of the, if they implement another version of OAuth, how do you react to that? Uh, internally, we use Drew for that, and he's done an outstanding job at it. All right, so we've gone through resources that you need to leverage. Uh, we've told you about a lot of the challenges that we ourselves face when embarking in, in the task of building a new connector. Uh, and we've also shared with you some of our development cycle. I feel like with that, you're pretty ready to go out there and build your own WDC first class, right? Is that it? Hold on. I didn't make nope. these slides, and I wasn't aware of these slides. <laughs> it's two years and a half, I want to say. That. Is that it? What, no, what else? No, it's not it. What, uh, because it's uh, data and theory there, and life is not that. What do you mean? Why? Why is it? Now you're just reading my mind. No, <laughs> stuff happens. Why? <laughs> Should okay. I have to say this? No. Remember, I write your review. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> there is a, an important thing that you need to understand. And I was on the, a breakout session uh, for the Netflix um, theme, and they received that very clearly. And I will take uh, that uh, phrase for you. Uh, it's not if something is going to go wrong in the future, is that simply it's going to go wrong. So you have to be ready. So you have to be uh, trained. You have to work out your mind. You have to work out your body. You have to be very, very agile on uh, reacting to these kind of things. But reacting in the mean that you know that something is going to happen and you are prepared for the change. You are prepared to make a turn and do things differently without affecting too much the outcome of your connector or your customer experience. Uh, it's simply that cha-cha-cha is going to be there, and you have to be ready to dance. It's so simple. Uh, so <laughs> be ready for the change. All right. I don't like that. but. <laughs> So let's recap some of the points that we've walked you through. Um, as we start, we tell you about the resources that we internally use. How do we ramp up devs when they start to work on a new connector? And some of the tools that we use ourselves when we just bootstrap a new connector that we're doing. And again, documentation, TC slides, and tools like the simulator, log viewer, GitHub, etc., are things that we highly encourage you to use. You have to pet uh, Cerberus. <laughs> All the three heads are very important. They are correlated. And each one of these heads is going to make the difference when you build your connector and if you are going to be successful or you are going to have to work many times on the same thing. Finally, these connectors are complex. On average, we write about 5,000 to 15,000 lines of code of the connectors that we've written. And so having a development cycle that you develop, we shared with you today what we do, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's what you need to do. The takeaway is for you to have a process, for you to develop a cycle that's repeatable and that allows you to learn from your experiences while you build these connectors. And chaos is out there, so be uh, as try as possible, uh, keep it simple, as simple as you can, keep it scalable, Keep it uh, modular so you can change stuff along the way without having a problem. For example, our uh, asynchronic uh, connection module uh, can use different uh, libraries because it depends on the API how you want to treat that. And you want to make that very simple to use while it's complex inside. So it's easy to change. And after all this, I think we give you like a knowledge transfer on what's the backstage 
of creating a web data connector. And I would like to uh, leave you with a simple thought. Uh, all this knowledge has no value if you don't use it. So go now, write your web data connector. Not now, because there are a lot of breakout sessions you want to see. But uh, keep your, your hands, uh, put your hands at work, start working, start experimenting. Uh, contact us. Your feedback will make us uh, all together, you and us, uh, to create a, a better product, a better Tableau each day. This is a, a community where we want to make everything better together. Cool. Well, we hope that uh, you've enjoyed the talk as much as uh, we've enjoyed talking to you. Our contact information is up there, and let, let's keep the conversation going. Um, there's going to be a survey that we highly encourage you to fill out. Uh, our daily jobs uh, doesn't involve public speaking, so we know we have a lot of room to grow and improve, um, so we'd appreciate your guys' feedback. Um, with that, that's all that we have. So if you have questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, and if you want to just like, you know, stick around, stick around. Yeah, we'd be we'd be happy to to stay and answer your questions. Sure. Uh, so uh, the question is: Is the way data connector generator compatible compatible with other connectors? No, with with the the earlier version. With early versions. Okay. Uh, all the documentation regarding that is on the on the um, on the resources. Uh, there are different versions of the Shim, which is the library that connects the web data connector to Tableau, that has a dependency on Tableau version. But the web data connector itself doesn't have that uh, dependency. It's only the amount of details you can work on, on your connector that is going to be improved, or uh, the cap capabilities uh, Tableau Desktop can provide and expose on the API. Yes? The question is, do we... Yeah, the, the question is, do we use our own framework internally to build web data connectors? And the answer is yes. yes. We use the same collateral that, uh, that you guys use. And so that's why we want to build a community uh, and hear your feedback, plus share with you some of the learnings that we've, uh, that we've gained along the way. Yes, dog footing is a must. Right, so the question is, I got excited. I want to write a named connector that looks like Tableau is shipping it. How do I do that? Um, today, the short question is, you can't. Um, but that's great feedback. We'd love to talk to you offline and see if there are other opportunities. This is where we essentially maybe would like to land, uh, where we are, all contribute to the connectivity story for Tableau. So we'd love to talk to you and about And it might that. be in the future of ILO. We don't know that yet, but it might be. Go to the ideas box and just yes. vote for that. Other questions? Yes. Is there any specific consideration like with, with Hyper coming into the ecosystem? Uh, does the connector framework kind of write down for both of them? Does it like to do a specific format right now? Or, uh, Your question? Okay, uh, so your question is uh, to make it uh, more uh, short. Is like if there is a relationship with, between web data connectors and Hyper, for example. Uh, the answer is no. There are two very different things. Uh, the web data connector is just a middleware where you can connect to any kind of data source, which can be a, a single file. 
a public API, a private API, you can build a connector. I build connectors to make my own uh, analysis on bugs for my uh, environment or for my IDE, the program I use to program. It generates logs, and I want to see the logs and make statistics. So, Essentially, the API is a layer above the data engine, and so you'll always be isolated from that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? questions? Well, just a few remarks. This morning we went to uh, another session on, uh, on Gele and... Yes, build your first web data connector. Yeah, first. This is a great component because it lets you let go deeper and lets you know everything that they didn't say because they didn't have enough time. So it's really good. Thank you. Uh, the other one is, can you show your email address? So sure. I'll go back. Gracias. <laughs> so uh, you can download this, uh, this uh, deck from the resources of TC17. All the decks are going to be available there. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, more questions? Yes. It depends on the API. So, so if the API allows us can you to the use, question? yes, you can you can answer that question. No, can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Uh, the the question was uh, if uh, when we use uh, WDC, should we uh, do a full uh, extract refresh or we apply incremental refreshes? And the answer is depending on the API capabilities. If I'm able to uh, ask the API a data set from a specific point. If the API allows that, it's like, a please, yes. We also want to acknowledge Brendan Lee. Brendan and Sam did this talk last yeah. year and did an outstanding job. Right now, we highly encourage you to go and see them talking about the extensions APIs. Uh, I'm sure that it's great. I'm going to go tomorrow. Good. Thanks, everybody.